Hello, and welcome to the five components of apprenticeship. I'm your host, Ricardo Ibarra. This webinar is designed for employers and businesses in any industry who are looking for solutions for their workforce problems. If you've ever said, I need to find more skilled workers, you'll discover how the five components of apprenticeship can be used to create a reliable pipeline of highly skilled employees for your business. If you're concerned about an aging workforce and finding new talent to grow your business, apprenticeship may be the answer. You'll hear from subject matter experts on how their organizations develop apprentices into qualified, competent, and loyal employees. As we go through today's webinar, I hope you'll see how apprenticeship can be a valuable worker training model. So without further ado, here are the five components of apprenticeship. Business involvement. Employers shape the apprenticeship program and provide input to keep its standards current. On-the-job training. Apprentices receive training from an experienced mentor. Related instruction. Technical education supplements apprentices' on-the-job training. Rewards for skill gains. Apprentices receive increases in wages as they gain higher level skills. National credential. Registered apprenticeship programs produce workers who are highly trained and fully qualified for the job. Now that we know the five components of apprenticeship, let's cover them in more detail. The first component of apprenticeship is business involvement. Employers serve as the foundation of every apprenticeship program. Employers not only determine the skills that workers should acquire during their apprenticeship, they continuously provide input so that the apprenticeship program remains current with changing industry trends, tools, and technology. Without dedicated employers to manage the program, apprenticeship would simply not exist. To learn more about business involvement, I met with Eleanor Oshitoy, Diversity and Inclusion Manager for Mortensen Construction in Kirkland. My name is Eleanor Oshitoy. I'm the Diversity Inclusion Manager for Mortensen. And um, as far as Mortensen, what we do with apprenticeship programs is we actually support them. Um, I'm part of actually the board of um, ANU. And what we do is we um, interview a lot of the apprentices on their programs and also hire them on our projects. The benefits that the training um, has, the apprenticeship training has for us as Morris is they actually are exposed to different trades. So they don't just focus on one specific trade, they can um, get a little sample. And then from there, the, the individual is able to determine which one actually resonates more with them. And from there, they can really um, become associated with different uh, mentorships, different prime contractors, and even the unions, and they learn, they gain more and more experience on the hand, on hand experience, which is fantastic because I'm that's how I learn is more hands on, and so from there they really get a better idea whether this is the field for them, and the majority of them realize it's it's much more rewarding than any job that they've had before, so that's a huge benefit for us because they're almost vetted before they even get hired onto Mortensen, which is it's a great value. You can't get that when you go to college. You go through a four year and then, you know, um, you don't even know if that's the career you want. So the value of apprenticeship on, on our projects, and especially to Mortensen's, if when I talk to a lot of apprentices um, and learning a little bit about their background, they've gone through a lot of uh, challenges, very difficult challenges sometimes, and they've overcome a lot of them. And they've also experienced a lot of different careers, or shouldn't say careers, but maybe different jobs. And through that time, they've determined that that's not the path that they want to go. And so they learn a lot of different trades within uh, that apprenticeship program. And then from there, they are able to find that this is not just a job, but it's a career that they can find uh, also fulfillment that they couldn't find in other jobs. And so that alone right there is a great value because these individuals have have, have gone through a lot. They've gone through, um, they've been resilient. Um, they've been able to overcome certain challenges that a lot of people may not have been able to experience. And so that bringing all that to the job is a great benefit to us. It gives us a well-rounded perspective that they can um, share with all of everyone on the project and also outside the project. How apprenticeship programs differ from other types of training, for example, let's say if you decide to go to a four-year college, um, you pick the, your major and your, and your minor, and you have to wait to change that. And then after that, you have to maybe go an additional year. So it's, and plus it's a lot, it costs a lot more. 
Um, so I don't know the numbers, but I know that there's, uh, the numbers are substantial. Um, on apprenticeship programs, you're able to get on-the-job training. Um, you are able to experience different types of skill sets and, and different trades, whether you want to be a carpenter, a plumber, electrician. You actually learn that throughout your training program, so you can determine uh, midway whether that's really what I want to focus on. And then you can get really specialized training for that. Um, so that's the huge difference right there, the cost and also the timing and the experience. Um, so that alone is a, it's a huge difference compared to others. What is involved for us as an uh, employer like Mortensen to be part of the apprenticeship program is we engage with all the, all the different apprenticeship programs. Um, and what we do from there is we pair those individuals with the right mentor on the project um, to help them communicate, learn how to communicate, and also explain and teach them further. So they go through training at the, train the apprenticeship programs, but then they also get additional training on the job. So the pairing is really important for us, the personalities and just understanding that um, it's gonna be a little bit different. There's, there's more, this is actual real life now. And so they go through safety, quality, leadership training with us, um, uh, processes and policies, because that's part of the entire, you know, even if you're an apprentice, you are a leader. You're, we want you to be, uh, feel like you're part of the team and even if you go to the union and all that, you are a part of the team. And we want you to learn to not just be someone that's thinking about pr uh, present employment with us, but future, uh, because that's, what's, that's the key. That's what we want at the very end of the day is we want to find individuals that we can actually hire on full-time at Mortensen. Having a training um, for apprentices, is, the return on investment on that for us is that we look at every employee, whether you're an apprentice or a seasoned employee or em employee, is that you go through training uh, because you don't want to take anything for granted and, and miss them something and assume that everybody knows what they're doing uh, because that's when you will get hurt. It's not you might, it's you will get hurt if you don't stay fresh and current. And the training actually provides an opportunity for you to also collaborate within that environment to learn maybe there is an, you've gained an experience that you can share with the entire class. So it's your opportunity to be heard, to have a voice, uh, because again, you're part of the team. So that's why training is really important because everybody needs it. Yes, I highly uh, recommend training uh, apprentices for any, any field, uh, whether it's construction or photography. It, gives an, it allows an individual to really get an idea of what it's gonna be like in real life. Uh, so to me, that's the best way to learn for I think a lot of people. So um, it's definitely a huge benefit. So one of the lessons learned that we have is uh, there's times that you're gonna meet an apprentice that um, you have great potential that you see in this particular uh, individual. And you put a lot of time and effort and support and education. And sometimes an individual, they just, that's not the, they don't have that self-worth quite there yet. And it's okay. And you have to be able to, um, I think for us, let go and just, you know, allow them the opportunity and continue to mentor them until that time where they're actually ready to uh, be more engaged. Because at the end of the day, they have to take ownership for that part of their life. And so um, that's one of the lessons learned that we have, because sometimes we do take it a little hard when, you know, we really want this individual. And sometimes life just has a lot more challenges that is just not the right timing. So um, that's a huge lesson uh, right there for us as well as an employer. I think for any employer, you have to first find out what is your culture? Uh, what, what do you really value? And how does that fit into the type of program, creating a program that will uh, model what your company is about? Uh, because at the end, that's what the, the individual is going to be learning is your company. Right, and so, and also find out how can you can also grow. So don't always look at it from a one-dimensional perspective, but uh, multiple levels, um, because it's about you also being interviewed by the apprentice themselves. So looking at your program in that way, looking at it from the outside in, I think will help you create a better uh, model for your for a program. The next component of apprenticeship is on-the-job training. 
apprentices receive structured, on-the-job training from an experienced mentor for typically not less than one year. In some industries, on-the-job training can be longer or shorter. On-the-job training is developed by mapping the skills and knowledge that the apprentice must learn over the course of the program in order to be fully proficient at the job. Greg Christensen, Apprenticeship Coordinator for the Pacific Northwest Iron Workers, shared their organization's on-the-job training requirements and details on how on-the-job training plays a critical role in apprenticeship. My name is Greg Christensen. I'm the Apprenticeship Coordinator with the Iron Workers Apprenticeship in Tequila, Washington. It's a four-year state-recognized apprenticeship, and uh, we've got about 500 apprentices at this point. In the Iron Workers Apprenticeship, uh, the on-the-job training, the it's basically you're earning while you, you learn, and uh, they go to school one month a year. The rest of the time, they're on the job, learning from the employers, learning from the journeyman on the job. Uh, so they're getting the skills passed down from a journeyman and uh, to their to into their hands, and there could be the next generation of journeymen and they're learning skills that may have taken a man or a woman years to figure out and they get past that down to them. And I always tell apprentices, that's why you wanna go out there, give it your best shot, show them some enthusiasm so they wanna pass those skills on to you. It's kind of a thing of respect. With on the job training, as, as far as the apprenticeship go, uh, like I say, they only go to school one month a year with the iron workers. We call it block training. And that's where they learn their technical things and they get their rigor certifications and things like that. The rest is all on the job. So uh, they're getting to put to use out in the field what they learned in class. And then also the benefits is the instructors, a lot of them have really uh, stringent or uh, complete safety programs and different protocols that the employers like. So then the employers are able to teach them and train them in, in the skill set that they're looking for. And then uh, it's just beneficial to the apprentice and also to the employer, getting a new skilled workforce. Employers are, with our program, when an apprentice goes out to work, they're dispatched to an employer. And like I say, one month a year, they come to school. So we schedule that with the apprentice and we schedule it with the employer. So we send out an, a letter to the employer and to the apprentice. Uh, the employer lays them off so they can come to school for that month. And because it's a state recognized apprenticeship in Washington state, one of the benefits is that you can collect unemployment while you're in school. So it's no cost to the employer uh, other than they're just laid off. And then at the end of their school, they can either be dispatched back to the employer or if the employer doesn't have a spot for them right now, they don't have to carry that employee until they're ready to fill that spot again. For the Iron Workers Apprenticeship, the on-the-job training, it consists of about 1,500 to 2,000 hours a year, uh, depending on how busy it is. Uh, every month, the apprentice is required to take a log and they log and record of what type of work they were doing, how many hours they worked a day, and they're, they're required to turn that in monthly. But also on that same log, the employer has a section where he evaluates the apprenticeship and gives them a score and has a place to write notes. Do they think they're doing good? Do they need help in certain areas? And then that's submitted to the Ironworkers Apprenticeship, and it's also submitted to the state. So the state has a record, the employer has a record and the iron workers all have a record. With on the job training, the benefits for an apprentice, uh, why they go out to work, there's some things that you just can't do in a classroom and you just can't do. Uh, we don't have the big buildings to erect or we don't have the, the rebar jobs. So that's where they're, re they're really dependent on the employers to be out there getting those skills that we can't teach them in the classroom. And uh, in the same thing, it's, it's beneficial for the employers also because uh, they're getting their hand in training the next generation, like I mentioned before, and they can, they don't, they're brand new clean slates, so they don't have a lot of bad habits that the employer has to retrain and stuff. So 
it's really beneficial for both. As far as uh, with apprentices, I would say just plan it like your regular day. Just teach them, know that when an apprentice comes out, that's exactly what they are. They're not at the journey level. So depending on what level in their apprenticeship they are, know that that's what you're getting, that you're getting, if it's a first year or brand new apprentice, don't expect them to know everything and uh, be a little bit patient, but don't be so lenient that they're going to get away with things because we want them to learn and grow as the employer does because it has to benefit both, both people, both parties. And uh, if apprentice isn't working out or they're not doing something right, they need to know so it can be corrected. But as far as day to day, treat them just like everybody else and uh, give them the, the tasks according to their skills. What I used to do when I worked in the field is I'd try out an apprentice as he uh, did the task that I assigned him. If he was doing good, I'd give him a little bit more and a little bit more. And it's just kind of like anything else like that. When apprentices get out on the job and they mix with the journeyman, uh, it, I think it's really valuable for the employer to, or the, whoever's running the job for the employer to kind of keep an eye out uh, and make sure that the apprentice and the journeyman can kind of get along together. Uh, some apprentices, uh, they may not get along with some people in the same way with the, the journeyman. And if you see uh, a situation like that, if you have the ability to rotate them around and assign them with somebody else or uh, remind the journeyman, I used to have to do this all the time. Hey, you had to start somewhere too. Don't forget, you, when you came into this trade, you didn't know everything. Think back of the, some of the, the silly things that you did uh, and just remember that's where they're at because a lot of times uh, journeymen and skilled craftsmen tend to forget and what's second nature for them isn't always second nature for that new person. So it's up to them. And I think it's kind of an honor to be able to pass those skills on to the next generation. With the big worries and the demands for skilled labor, and there's not being any out there, who is gonna train the next workforce? You know, it's up to us to train the next workforce. So it would be nice to uh, see contractors take on that responsibility because when you go to call and you want to get a skilled person, it's kind of like the luck of the draw. You know, you don't know what you're going to get. But if you're taking an active part and an active role in training the next workforce, then you can be assured that you're going to get a quality uh, person out there. Related supplemental instruction is the next component of apprenticeship. Apprentices receive technical education that complements their on-the-job learning. This instruction delivers the technical, workforce, and academic competencies that apply to the job. It can be provided by a community college, a technical school, an apprenticeship training school, or by the business itself. Education partners collaborate with business to develop the curriculum based on the skills and knowledge needed by apprentices. All partners work together to identify how to pay for the related instruction, including the cost to the employer and other funds that can be leveraged. To serve apprentices in rural areas who weren't able to commute to a college for their supplemental instruction, the Washington Association of Community and Migrant Health Centers created online courses to complement their medical assistant and dental assistant apprenticeship programs. I interviewed Katherine Lechner, Workforce Development Manager, for more details. I'm Katherine Lechner. I'm the Workforce Development Manager here at the Washington Association of Community and Migrant Health Centers which is a really long way of saying we're the state's primary care association. So we do a number of different things for our health centers that we represent. Um, mainly, I work in workforce development, so a lot of underserved communities needing support to develop workforce. Um, one of the ways we do that is through healthcare apprenticeships. So we have dental assisting apprenticeship and medical assisting apprenticeship.
Supplemental course instruction is really vital for our employers, but also a really great resource for our apprentices themselves. So it allows them to not only have on-the-job training where they're working 40 hours a week, in our case, inside of a clinic setting, where they're getting hands-on training by um, either their provider or their coach that's working at the same license level, but they're also able to go home and work on an online platform that we've developed. So we work through the Canvas system, which if you're familiar with a community college system that's pretty universal, um, it's really interactive. So they have course instruction from an expert um, in the field that we employ, so a medical assistant or a dental assistant themselves. So they do um, online modules, they do forum posts with their um, class, they watch skill videos, they take quizzes and exams all online. So it's kind of a traditional learning model all online. Um, the benefit for employers in that case is that they're ensuring that the course that we are providing is really up to par that they would be getting if they were going to a traditional college system or a private, um, private technical college or something like that. So we're able to have a curriculum that's parallel with what they're learning on the job, going home, doing 10 to 12 hours of work a week online, and getting a really well-rounded education out of that. So what supplemental instruction looks like for our programs, first I'll talk about medical. So medical assisting, they do 364 hours of online training. Seven of the 12 months at the beginning of the program, all in technical skills. So this is really the heavy lift for all of the medical assistants when they are learning all of the clinical skills that they would be doing. So they're doing them on a daily basis in the clinic and then they're building on their education during that first seven months. So they're doing everything from learning vitals, medical asepsis, all the way through blood draws, EKGs, and all of those really technical skills. After the first seven months of the program, they go into our patient-centered medical home model of our curriculum. So this is really a principal type model that all of our community health centers have adopted, um, a better way for the care team to really have integrated care for their employees. So they're learning everything during those last five months of their instruction, doing um, care coordination, motivational interviewing, cultural competency. So they're really getting a well-rounded education during those 364 hours. For dental, it's much more technical that they're doing. So it's a year-long program as well. So 12 months of all technical skills. So it's same, similar curriculum to medical assisting where they're doing all technical skills, watching skill videos, forum posts, exams and quizzes, but it's all to um, the highest license of a dental assistant. So they're doing 476 hours of online instruction. So the way that that supplements what they're learning on the job is that they're really able to have patients come in, they're working with their care team on a daily basis, they're watching procedures, they're starting from the beginning of the program, they're starting to do hands-on procedures, both in medical and dental assisting from day one with supervision. Then they're able to go online, do their coursework that's building upon all of those, um, and really apply that, ask questions with their course instructor, watch the skill videos, take a final exam on all of those skills, and then be able to confidently go back into their, their clinic and practice independently with patients as their care team sees fit. So the way supplemental instruction really benefits the apprentices themselves is that it, it develops um, a system of structure for them. So this is a very intense program. It's a 12 month program for both medical and dental assisting. So it's, it's pretty, uh, it's a very heavy load that they're having to do. So they're working full time in the clinic. Most of them, if not all of them, have families, activities, children that they're taking care of as well. So supplemental course instruction, even though we're asking them to do another full year of education on top of their full year of working, it really provides a structure so that they can see on a weekly basis, I'm going to read this chapter in our textbook, I'm going to interact, interact with our instructor at this level, I'm going to do a quiz, an exam, make flashcards, um, interact with the other students online, do activities in the clinic based on our online work that we're doing. So it provides kind of a weekly structure so that they can not only learn the clinical skills at a really fast pace, but they can make sure that they're learning the education, the theory behind all of the clinical skills, the why of what they're doing, and apply that on a weekly basis. 
So as, as, as intense as it can be, we really hear that without that backbone of the baseline education that they're learning um, throughout the course of the program, the clinical skills that they're learning hands-on are lost a bit. So we really need those two to be married together to provide a really well-rounded education for them. So in starting the program and bringing on a new apprentice to this, there's a lot of questions that we approach the employer with to make sure they're armed um, in bringing on an apprentice who's going to be successful and somebody who that they're going to retain for employment from years to come. So one of the ways that we do that is making sure that the apprentice is really capable of taking on this heavy lift of not only doing on-the-job training throughout the year, but also having um, the tools and the ability to complete the supplemental instruction. So we make sure that employee, employers are identifying apprentices who, one, have the tools, so they have technology at home, they have internet access, so that they can actually complete the online instruction. We also ask that they have a care team in place, so not only a coach identified in the clinic that they're working with on a daily basis, but someone who knows what they're doing online on a weekly basis as well. So they're not just working in the clinic, doing their technical skills with their coach and kind of losing the online piece. We want somebody who is in the clinic identified that can check in with the apprentice. How's it going online? Do you have any technical problems that you need help with? Um, is there anything that you're learning online or a skill video that you're doing online that, don't, that doesn't make sense? Something we can kind of bridge that gap. Um, as much as our organization likes to be the administrators of that, we can't catch every single problem. So we really rely on employers to fill that gap for us. Um, and it really ensures that they have an apprentice who's committed and dedicated to the program, not only during the 40 hours a week that they're employed with them, but also after hours that they're committed to completing the education piece of this. So as we were working to develop both of our programs in healthcare apprenticeships, both medical and dental, we really thought about the apprenticeship model and what our employers needed to produce an, to produce an employee that was really going to be well-rounded and capable of doing this work. Um, a big part of that came from us needing a traditional education model. Even though it is online, we are following a textbook, we are following a regular curriculum that you would see in a comparable community college or, or technical school. Um, so that was really a choice that we, with input from employers, came to pretty, pretty quickly. So it really works for us. Um, advice for employers wanting to adopt this type of model um, in a different industry. I would really work with community colleges, um, programs that were already developed, teaching something, an industry trade that is already well established, and seeing how um, a curriculum can be built from that. You know, there's textbooks on almost anything out there, there's online training almost anywhere that you could find. So, really finding something that employers find useful. Um, it doesn't have to be something as intense as a medical profession, um, but even having another layer of learning we find really valuable. So, not only is an apprentice doing their work, they're really thinking about it in the evenings and on weekends of how I can further my education. And we find that really, really important and vital for our employees. Key to motivating apprentices are rewards for skill gains. This component of apprenticeship sees apprentices receive increases in pay as their skills and knowledge increase. Starting with an entry wage and an ending wage, businesses establish a progressive wage increase as apprentices achieve skill benchmarks. Progressive wage increases help reward and motivate apprentices as they advance through their training. I video conferenced with Pat Perez, business manager of Plumbers and Steamfitters Local 44 in Spokane, to learn about their apprenticeship program and its incremental pay increases. Yeah, my name is uh, Pat Perez. I'm the business manager for the Plumbers and Steamfitters Union, Spokane, Washington, and I also sit on the Washington State Apprenticeship Council representing labor on the Washington State Apprenticeship Council. So, uh, uh, you know, twofold, threefold, fourfold, there's there's a lot of advantages to that. Uh, first of all, a guy knows, a guy or a gal knows what they're going to start at wage-wise, and they know what they're going to progress as long as they're taking care of business. You know, uh, I'll refer to our program quite a bit because that's the program 
I know 100% my heart and how most of the programs do it, but, you know, everybody knows what wage rate you start at and knows where you end and, and the things you have to do to attain those wage rates. It's not like it's an automatic pay increase. You know, you have the, the person, the employee has to do certain things themselves to get those raises. So it's not an, a simple pay raise. It's just, you know, a wage progression as they progress. Uh, they're a very important part, the pay increases, um, because, you know, we have we start at a starting spot and then we go to an ending spot. Now, for businesses and companies that don't pay minimum wage, that's going to be a problem because, you know, there's no nowhere to step up to. This would be great for anything, say, after $17 an hour because then you could start an apprenticeship at minimum wage. You know what you got going into the cost. You know what the training costs are going to be. So for the employer, you know what those costs are. And then for the apprentice, they know if they take care of business, they'll be getting a pay raise. And at the same time, when you're doing this, you're also building up a, uh, a you know, company esprit, esprit de corps. You know, you're showing some pride. Uh, people take ownership in apprenticeships. They're proud of where they come from and stuff. So it's, it's a great deal. People, again, they know what kind of money they can make after they start. So there's a, a beginning and an end. You know, we start our apprentices out at 45% of a journeyman wage rate. What that does is, you know, gets them above uh, minimum wage, which you have to do by law. And then it, it's a great starting spot for our, our particular local here. It's, it's around 17 bucks an hour for someone to start out. Uh, so there's a probationary period, so within that one year of their apprenticeship, ours is a five-year pro program. They can, uh, we can kick them out for any reason whatsoever, or they can drop out what, for whatever reason. Um, and it's kind of a good tryout that way. It works out. You're not putting years of time into a person or an individual, and uh, and they come to either love it or they don't. It's not for them. I mean, the trades aren't for everybody. Any job's not for everybody, so it's a good tryout period. Uh, once again, they start out at 45% of journeyman scale, which at right now is 36 bucks an hour. And then they get 100% of their health and welfare because law mandates that they get insurance, which is, in our particular uh, case, is 8.50 an hour. And then they get 45% of their pensions. So every six months, our apprentices, once they've completed 1,000 hours, um, they get roughly uh, seven and a half five to seven and a half percent increase every six months. Now, that's not automatic. They have to do certain things. They have to have their state apprenticeship card current. That's super easy to do, but you wouldn't believe how many people uh, let that go. Um, but that's one of the requirements. They've got to pass any tests within that time period in their schooling. Um, their progress reports reviewed by whoever they work for. It's got to be decent, you know. Um, and then the last thing is they got to have their school hours. And after that, uh, they get those four things done, then um, they they get their raise, and we approve that at the committee level. So we have 10 steps. Every six months, there's a raise. It's a five-year apprenticeship program. After the 10th step, they're at 90%, and after that, it's turnout. It's full-scale journeyman. No matter what you do in life, the bottom line is how much am I going to make and how much can I make? And, uh, you know, if you go to a job like a McDonald's or Walmart or whatever, you know you're stuck at minimum wage. With a progressive wage increment, a person can see how much they're going to make and if it's, it's for them. Because I think not only do you want a, a cheaper labor force, which apprenticeship does, but you're training your younger workforce to replace the older workforce with the wage progressions. At least someone knows how much they're going to be making and as long as they're taking care of business. It's not an automatic thing. The whole purpose of apprenticeship is taking a, a non-skilled or very little skilled person and making them skilled in your particular business venture or your, your area of expertise. You know, um, most people, there's not college education for manufacturing, construction or whatever. And these are the kind of uh, uh, businesses that are perfect for an apprenticeship model. So um, for budgeting, you know what you pay your worker no matter what industry it's in. So then you could take whatever percentage, you know, you'd have to figure out what you'd want someone to start at with. And frankly, the recruiting sets that up. I mean, if you're in the plastics industry and there's, you know, a, a plant down the way, you know, you know what you're paying people. So those are things. But yes, you can budget all that. You can figure out what the cost of the apprentices is to the 
to the company, and then more importantly, uh, what the cost is for training and put that into your budget. I, I think apprenticeships are a great way to, uh, to increase your workforce and educate them to your uh, particular business and or need. And, uh, you know, the one thing we haven't talked about that's very important that the construction industries has done real well with is you build up that pride of working for who you work for because, first of all, that employee thinks that, you know, you're taking or what they know that you're taking care of because you care enough about a training to train the employees. So I think some of that stuff goes a long ways to retention on top of recruitment. The final component of apprenticeship is a national occupational credential. Every graduate of a registered apprenticeship program receives a nationally recognized credential which serves to indicate that they possess the greatest breadth and depth of knowledge required for their occupation. Apprenticeship programs are designed to ensure that apprentices master every skill and have all the knowledge they need to be fully proficient for a specific occupation. I spoke with Andrea Anderson, an apprenticeship coordinator for the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries, to learn how this credential benefits both employers and workers. My name is Andrea Anderson and I am an apprenticeship consultant with the State of Washington Apprenticeship Section. I actually work with employers to help start apprenticeship programs. I work with existing apprenticeship programs to help them expand their programs and um, help them make changes where they're interested um, to really help improve on their programs all the time. That journey le level certificate, you don't get that just from going to school or just from working. It really is the combination of that structured on the job training with a mentor, that experienced master crafts person or experienced worker who is imparting their you know, the greatest depth and breadth of knowledge that they have, um, along with, you know, um, you're also, as an apprentice, going to school, learning the theory behind what you're doing on the job. So apprenticeship is really a combination of about 93% structured on-the-job training, and then about 7% uh, related supplemental instruction. That's what we call it here in Washington, RSI. It's different in other states, quite frankly. Um, but we call it that here. And that RSI is the theory behind what they're doing on the job. So it helps them understand not just why, you know, not just I'm going to push the button on a machine, but, oh, here's why I'm pushing the button. And if something goes wrong, I can troubleshoot that and figure that out and really um, have a total picture of this whole machine or process. So the benefit of the journey level certificate to employers really is the journey level certificate represents a standard of excellence, okay? But it wasn't um, a standard of excellence for industry. And it was really, it provides the certainty that that journey level worker does have the greatest depth and breadth of knowledge. The beauty of that piece too is that all of those skills and knowledge are actually defined by industry. So industry has a say in um, any new advances or here are the foundational pieces that every single person needs and then you can specialize beyond that. In apprenticeship, um, people may have learned that you have um, periodic wage increases as skills increase. So for the apprentice, they are sure that at the end of their apprenticeship, they are going to get that journey level wage, okay? That the employer has determined, yep, this is the value we put on this journey level certificate. And that if you complete this apprenticeship program successfully, we're making a commitment to you to not only help train and develop you and to keep you on when your apprenticeship is done, but also to pay you that great value for your commitment to finish your related supplemental instruction and successfully complete your structured on the job training. The number one thing that the, some of the strategies for employers when they're thinking about journey level certification is really to think about what their short and long-term goals are. Apprenticeship 
It may be low cost in the beginning, but as that apprentice's skills increase, their wage increases, and they become more productive on the job. So staggering apprentices, um, so like I had said before, if you've got 100 employees and you wanna grow your company over the next 10 years to 1,000 employees, the way uh, to do that, a good strategy, would be to um, implement a cohort, five, maybe 10, even 20 apprentices each year because what happens is apprenticeship actually builds your next leaders in your company. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're your next owners. It means that even at the ground level, they have a commitment and a real ownership of the work that they're doing. So things for an employer to consider in addition to the journey level wage rate, um, when they're thinking about journey level certification for their workers, are um, really who are their subject matter experts? What skills and knowledge do they want to cultivate or grow within their company? What kind of new technology do they want to incorporate into their company? By having that um, clearly defined in advance, it will help to determine how your mentors go about training their employees. There are a lot of services available from the state of Washington apprenticeship section to help apprenticeship programs, to help employers um, implement apprenticeship within their company. Um, but the company really does need to figure out long and short term or short and long term strategies or training goals. They also need to um, really get clear about what, what I had just said with the specific technology and skills they want to transfer. Um, they need to be clear about how they want to grow or do they just want to maintain their workforce. Um, and they also really, um, I think one of the most tricky parts of implementing an apprenticeship program so implementing journey level certification is um, having the administrative infrastructure in place to really manage the apprentices. It's not, um, it's not that labor intensive to do it, but it does require a commitment and it has to be a top down commitment. It can't just be the managers um, who are on the front lines working with the apprentices. It really has to be an employer, the upper management and even the owner's commitment to using uh, apprenticeship training as a, a model for training their workforce. Let's review. The five components of apprenticeship ensure that employers have access to a stable pipeline of qualified workers and that apprentices are equipped to work in their industry with the knowledge and skills they need to be successful. Business involvement. Employers are the foundation of the apprenticeship program and provide input to keep its standards current. On the job training. Apprentices receive training from an experienced mentor while doing the work. Related instruction. Technical education supplements apprentices on the job training in the classroom, the workplace, or online. Rewards for skill gains. Apprentices receive increases in wages as they gain higher level skills, incentivizing their advancement as they become more valuable to industry employers. National Credential. Registered apprenticeship programs produce workers who are highly trained and fully qualified for the job. Upon completion, the worker is ready to advance their career and be an asset to employers regardless of location. We've created resources, marketing templates, and tools, as well as a helpful quick start guide to developing your own apprenticeship program. Visit ApprenticeshipWA.com to learn more.